All of us have a story, but we may not know our why. We may be renting someone else's story for us and not even know it. You know, that happened to me. I didn't realize that until later in life when I wrote my own story. So here's a little bit about it. I was born and raised in Maryland outside of Washington, DC. It was a great place to grow up. And I came from a creative family that encouraged curiosity. My mom was an artist and what she would do is give my sisters and I blank pages and canvases and say, go for it. I was the oldest of all my sisters. I have three younger sisters. And my mom would say, go and read to them. Even if I didn't know how to read, she said, use your imagination. And she'd give me a picture book. And then I'd make up stories about the pictures. There was once, I still remember, it was really big in my mind. It, it was, there was a circus that was coming to town and we all wanted to go. And my parents had to let us down. But the next thing, my mom had painted the circus in the basement and didn't tell us. And then she took us down there. She had painted it on all the walls so we could visit the circus at any time. Then I went to school. School was different. My first grade teacher introduced herself and then said, in my class, you follow orders and there are no questions. First thing I did is raise my hand and say, uh, why can't we ask questions? And she gave me this look, so I shut up. <laughs> then she handed out uh, pieces of paper with, uh, from a coloring book and told us to draw. So I did, all over the page. She comes by, she takes my paper and gives me another one and told me, you got to draw it in the right way. I said, I, I don't know the right way, what is it? And she pointed to what other students were doing. I kept doing that. Why this, what that? And next thing I know, she sent me to the principal's office. That was the beginning of sending me to the principal's office for probably several days, almost a week. It wasn't long before my parents were asked to come in to talk about my behavior. And they also mentioned my reading problem. There wasn't another school for me to go to and my parents tried to change the system and work with them but it did the only thing they could do was to put me in a track for low readers and for me to be compliant. I wanted to get along. I, I wanted to belong. So the best thing for me to do was to be the shy little girl in the back of the class and not raise my hand or ask any questions. I did just enough to participate. And that's what I did most of my education. Actually, I have to say the schools I went to were really good schools and the teachers were good. I mean, it, a lot of it was, I had made that decision, that choice to follow orders and not make any um, problems because I didn't want to be a troublemaker but I wanted to get through school, so I did just enough to graduate, and I did. Now that last year, that senior year, my dad got a job in California, and they decided to wait until I graduated and move the next day. That wasn't fun. <laughs> I had friends there, and I had to leave all my friends and miss all my graduation parties. I was pretty sad. In fact, I was feeling really sorry for myself. And something hit me. I thought, I'm in a new place. Nobody knows me. No one knows my labels. I have an opportunity to start over. So I found the community college nearby and I decided to take some classes. Next thing, I have a voice and a choice. I can ask questions. I can take any classes I want. And the teachers really got to know me. They got to, you know, figure out, 
boy, you like to write and you're very curious and you're taking all these classes and you can see you're creative. No one had ever said that. I loved it and I got a 4.0. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I knew that someday I'd like to figure out a way to change education so it's more like that at the community college. But I went to my counselor and asked, you know, her some issues about what I'd do next. And she said, Barbara, you know, you did such a good job in science. Why don't you look into the dental hygiene program here and apply? There were 700 applicants. 18 spots, and I got one of the spots. I became a hygienist. And then I got a great job with a wonderful dentist and got married. A few years later, we had amazing children, two children, Sarah and Andrew, very creative. I decided creativity and curiosity is really important. And so we carried that on with our own children. What was really good about hygiene is that I got to work part-time, raise my children, and also volunteer or work at the school. It's kind of nice when you know you can kind of balance everything, and I did. One of the things that hit me then was that this was a time when technology was just becoming big in schools. And I loved it. When I saw the first computer, I had to take it apart and put it back together again. And I wanted to learn how you can use technology in schools, so I went back to school to get that information, lessons, ideas. And then the school asked me if they could, I could teach computers and teach the teachers how to use them. So I went back to school to learn more. And eventually I started a computer program and did that two days a week and hygiene. Oh, I loved it. In fact, I remember some of the programs I took, like remember Oregon Trail? I would take it so it was a lot more creative and very curious so the kids wanted to know who died the next day. Or It was fun. It was fun. I mean, we, they didn't really die. If you remember our country, it was fun for me and it was fun for them. There was one night, I had a long day, came home and we were having our house remodeled and the deck wasn't done yet. And I looked out on the deck and my dog was out there and I had to go get her and I tripped and I fell. And I must have hit my head because I was unconscious underneath the deck and they could barely get me out and when they did, my leg was broken. I had to have a full cast and I was recuperating it. It was going to take four months. All I could think about were my patients. You see, in hygiene, I had these patients that were following me from dentist to dentist. And I was even teaching dental hygiene then. I thought, what are they going to do without me? I found out that they had hired one of my students who had just graduated to take my place. And guess what? She was great. They really didn't need me. They just needed someone who, who, to clean their teeth. <laughs> I wasn't indispensable after all. Then when I did go back, something was wrong with my fingers. I was, they were going numb and burning and my foot was dropping. So when I went to a neurologist, they said, when you fell, it looks like you crushed three of your vertebrae. And I could tell something was wrong. So I had to have more surgery. It was a scary time. And I tried to do dental hygiene, but it wasn't working. So I went to my family and I said, I, I can't do hygiene anymore. I really want to teach. And they went, why are you waiting so long? It's what you love. And then my sister Sandy said to me, you know, it's about time you went from dental flossing to mental flossing. They were right, and I knew it. I was renting this story that the patients only needed me. Plus, I was afraid to change. 
So I ended up going back to school, became a teacher, started doing um, coaching, and I wrote grants and became project manager. It was all exciting for me. And then I went to Q. I started being involved with Q and even wrote the professional development column for 17 years. In fact, one of my first assignments was to go to ISTE and find 12 stories of unique things that were happening in education. It was amazing. You know those 12 stories? I, many of those people, I have connections still today, and I still have that issue. I loved that. Oh, it's amazing how the connections happened and what those meant and what the stories meant. I didn't even realize how much until I found Ikigai. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's the Japanese concept for the meaning of life. I needed to know more about me and my why. So what it does, it has four elements. It's what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. That last one, I changed it to what you're valued for because I was staying for the money. It was more than the money. I needed to do something that was my purpose, my why. And then I wanted to find more stories from other people that I had met in education. And some of the people were telling me different, different things about their lives. So I said, you know, I got to find more stories. So I started a podcast, the Rethinking Learning podcast, almost three and a half years ago. It was amazing. Some people said, I've never told anyone this before, but... And I said, this is going on the internet. And it was when they finally told their story, things changed, even the connections that we had. And some people stopped and said, can I talk to you after, privately? And they would tell me they, they weren't happy. They had tried this or they had tried that to try to make the situation better. But they, wanted, they didn't want to leave their students. That hit me. It was like me. I, I was working with a mask and goggles and crying behind my mask. I couldn't leave my patients. And I thought, they're crying behind their smile because of their students. But you know, we talked about it. There are students everywhere that need you. And then some of them didn't know their story or their why. When they start pulling it together, they did their own Iggy guy and or something like that. It started hitting that them, you know, they were figuring out they were not living their life, they were renting someone else's or some other story in their head. It's all about the choices we make. That story you have is amazing. Write it, share it, and tell it. You'll find your why, and it's going to be amazing. I cannot wait to hear it. This is great.